In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Continuing on our lecture series of the Theotokos, we come to the point of, uh, after the betrothal of Mary and Joseph. But before we return to the factual presentation of what is known about the life of the Virgin Mary, let us linger for a moment on the interesting story that comes to us from the Apocrypha again. Even though Joseph accepted the assurance of the angel and, and he did marry Mary, he was afraid that anybody noticing her as pregnant would accuse her of adultery or of him of defiling her. And even though he was willing to cover her up, he was afraid that a trial through the drinking of the water of conviction would censor both of them. The trial by the drinking of the water of conviction is found in Numbers chapter 5 verses 11 through 30 and here is how it goes if any man's wife went astray and acted unfaithfully against her husband even though undetected and the husband became suspicious and jealous he could bring his wife to trial before the Sanhedrin and two witnesses who could who would corroborate the suspicions of the husband and made to drink the water of conviction this was pure water mixed with some dust from the floor of the tabernacle of the witness if the woman if the woman was guilty her belly would swell and her thigh would fall off if not nothing would happen to her. If found guilty, the man was compelled to divorce her and she would be disinherited. So Joseph is portrayed as telling Mary, the crime of adultery will fall upon us for her committing it, the adultery and concealing it from him. And the water of conviction will censor us both, he said. But here is the scenario. Joseph, who was a member of the Sanhedrin himself, missed the last meeting of the body. When asked by a scribe by the name of Annas, who was sent to the house to find out why he had missed the meeting, Joseph responded that it was because he was too tired from the work and the trip. And the trip was from the seashore where he was building houses. Then Annas noticed that Mary was pregnant. So he left in a hurry and reported it to the priest with these words. Joseph has defiled the virgin he received from the temple of the Lord. He had married secretly and did not report it to the sons of Israel. Then the priest Abiathar had Joseph arrested and brought to the temple with Mary. The priest then said to Mary, Why did you do this? Why did you stoop so low and forget the Lord our God? Mary wept bitterly and said, As the Lord my God lives, I stand pure before him and declare that I have known no man. The priest then turned to Joseph and said, Why did you seduce such a great and glorious virgin who was fed like a dove in the temple by the angels of God? She never desired to have anything to do with the man because she was dedicated 
and she dedicated herself to God. Had you not done this, this she would have preserved her virginity to the end. But Joseph vowed and swore that he had never touched her, saying, As the Lord lives, I am innocent of touching and anything concerning with her pregnancy and her virginity. So the priest was forced to give them both to drink the water of conviction or testing even though this is a highly unusual, since the law states, this is the law in cases of jealousy, when a wife, though under her husband's authority, goes astray and defiles herself, or when the spirit of jealousy, jealousy, jealousy comes upon a man and he is jealous of his wife, then he shall set the wife before the Lord and the priest shall execute upon them this law. The man shall be free of any, of any iniquity, but the woman shall bear her iniquity. And this we read in Numbers chapter 5, verse 29 through 30. That is, the man was not subject to this law. When this water had no effect on either Joseph or Mary, the priest said, If the Lord God did not reveal your sin, neither will I judge you. And Joseph took Mary, and he went to his house, rejoicing and glorifying the God of Israel. So why do you suppose the Apocrypha would create such a story except to convince the Jews of the absolute truth of the mystery? So now we come to the birth of our Lord. We are indeed very familiar with the gospel story of the birth of Christ. Now let us look, though, how the Apocrypha embellishes the story, though. As Joseph was preparing to depart from Nazareth, he was wondering how he was going to enroll Mary, the young maiden. Should he enroll her as his wife, he would feel ashamed because of the great difference in age. You have to remember, Joseph is about 80 years old and Mary is about 15, 16 years old. Should he enroll her as his daughter? And if he did this, he would be, it would cause eyebrows to raise because all the people knew that she was not his daughter. So he said to himself, when the time of the Lord comes, let him do as seems best to him. Then he saddled up the donkey and put Mary on it, and one of his sons led it, and he said to his other sons who followed, come. So they traveled, the travel was slow for both men and the animals. The average Travel time for people was about 15 miles per day, while donkeys and caravans tried to make 20 miles per day. Within three miles of Bethlehem, they rested at a well. Joseph turned and saw that Mary was very sad. He thought that maybe she was in pain because of her pregnancy. But then he turned around again and saw how happy she was. So he asked her, Mary, how is it that sometimes you are sad and then your face is bright again? And she replied, I see two people before me. 
One is sad in the morning and the other is glad and rejoicing. That is, one rejoicing in the birth of the Messiah and the other refusing to accept him. The little town of Bethlehem was crowded with all the people who had come from all the outlying districts to register for the tax. There was no place for them to settle. Suddenly Mary says to Joseph, take me off the donkey because I am going to have the child. And where shall I take you, he asked. I have no idea, Mary said, but please, I need to get off this animal. He took her off the donkey and found a shepherd's cave nearby and took her to it. Then leaving his sons with her, he went out to find a midwife coming down from the hill country and said to Joseph, Where are you going? And he answered, I am looking for a Hebrew midwife. And she gestured that she was one and said to him, Are you an Israelite? Yes, he answered. The midwife, whose name was Zelomi, continued, Who is going to deliver in the cave? A woman betrothed to me, said Joseph. She is not your wife? The woman asked. And Joseph replied, It is Mary, who has been reared in the temple of the Lord. By lot I have obtained her as my wife, yet she is not my wife yet, but is conceived of the Holy Spirit. And the midwife then said, It is truly true. And Joseph answered, Come and see. And Zilomi went with him. And they stood in the cave, and behold, a luminous cloud overshadowed the cave, which made Zilomi remark, My soul has been magnified this day, because my eyes have seen these strange things, because salvation has been brought forth to all of Israel. And then suddenly the cloud disappeared, and a great light shone in the cave that blinded their eyes. Little by little the light decreased. Then they beheld the infant at the breast of the virgin. Are you the mother of the child? the midwife asked. And when the Virgin Mary assented, Zalomi said, you are not at all like the daughters of Eve. And the virgin said, Just as my son has no equal among the children, so his mother has no equal among the women. The midwife then went out of the cave and met Salome, another midwife, and said to her, Salome, I have a strange sight to relate to you. A virgin has given birth, a thing which nature does not admit. And Salome, who was Mary's mother's sister's daughter, thus her first cousin, did not believe that it was possible for a virgin to give birth and sought the proof. So she went into the cave and tried to examine Mary and sought the proof. And she examined Mary with her finger, whereupon her finger withered. And she cried and repented and asked for forgiveness for her unbelief. And she took the baby in her arms and her finger was immediately healed. The Blessed Jerome writes that on the precise moment of the Lord's birth, no midwife assisted at his birth. Mary, with her own hands, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, herself 
both mother and midwife, and Saint Clement of Alexandria, of Alexandria, around the year 215 AD, expressed the ideas not prominent as yet among the fathers, wrote, for certain people say that Mary examined by the midwife after she had given birth was found to still be a virgin. The title ever virgin, Hypothenos, was first used by St. Peter of Alexandria in 311 and again was used by St. Athanasius the Great who was one of the first to argue the perpetual virginity of the Virgin Mary. Apart from assisting the mother, the midwife's duties include washing the baby, rubbing it with salt, rinsing it with water and oil, and then wrapping it in swaddling, swaddling bands. The procedure of applying salt was not only used as a disinfectant, but the Jews at that time believed that salt rubbed all over the baby and the skin would harden it. Also, they believed that the soft bones would grow straight and firm if they were bound tightly. So the infant would be wrapped in these bands for seven days. Then the process was continued until the child was 40 days old. And these bands were four to five inches wide and five to six yards long. Byzantine iconographers have often presented the scene of the bathing of Christ the child by two women which are identified by the Apocrypha as Zilomi and Salome. Not only did the birth of Christ not violate the virginity of, the, of Mary, but the birth came about without any pain. Both of these are articles of faith for the true Christian belie believer. One author, who was a French bishop and writer from, who lived in 1627 to 1704 by the name of Jacques Rousset, wrote, he came out as a shot of light and as a ray of sun. His mother was astonished seeing him appear so suddenly. The delivery was free of cries and pains and of course, anxieties. Wondrously conceived, he was born even more wondrously. And the Holy Fathers considered his birth even more astonishing than his conception by a virgin. Had not Isaiah prophesied as much? Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she was delivered of a son. And this is in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7. And the theological term, Theotokos, is one of the most fundamental of Christian piety. Saint John of Damascus writes, We behold that God was born of her, not implying that the divinity of the word received her from the beginning of its being, but meaning that God the word himself, who was begotten of the Father timelessly before all ages, was the first, was with the Father and the Spirit without beginning and through eternity, took up his abode in these last days for the sake of our salvation in the virgin's womb and was without change made flesh and was born of her 
For the Holy Virgin did not bear a mere, did not bear a mere man, but a true God. Not only God, but God incarnate. Who did not bring now a body from heaven, nor simply pass through the Virgin as a channel, but received from her flesh of like essence to our own, and, subs and subsisting <clears throat> in himself. For if a body had come down from heaven and had not partaken of our nature, what would have been the use of becoming man? For the purpose of God, the word becoming man was that the very nature which had, which had sinned and fallen and become corrupted should triumph over the deceiving tyrant and so be freed of all corruption. The mother of God for this, Matthautokos embraces the whole mystery of the dispensation. Hence, it is with this justice, the truth, that we call Mary the Theotokos. Saint John of Damascus continues saying, We never say that the Holy Virgin is the mother of Christ, because this appellation came about in order to do away with the title of the mother of God, Theotokos, and to bring dishonor on the mother of God, who alone in truth is worthy of honor above all creation. The term Theotokos was once rejected by the heretic Nestorius, a Syrian theologian and patriarch of Constantinople from 428 to 431, who thus split the two natures of Christ and referred to his mother as Christoto, Christotokos, the one who bore Christ the man, not Theotokos, the one who bore Christ the God. The friend and counsel of Nestorius in his early years was the presbyter Anastasius, who in one of his sermons said, no one should call Mary Theotokos because Mary was a human being and it is impossible for God to be born from a human. This shook both clergy and laity who were always taught to speak of Christ as God and never to split his divinity from his humanity. Nestorius, however, instead of rebuking this notion, in turn favored Anastasios's speech or sermon rather and approved it. And he himself rejected the term Theotokos. The true faith was defended against the heresy of Nestorius by St. Cyril of Alexandria in 376, or rather who lived between 376 to 444, who made the motto of his Christological battles the fact that the Virgin is, a the is the Theotokos, and he became the heart and soul of the Third Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431 AD, which restored the dogma of the Theotokos forever with these words, we confess that our Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, consubstantial with the Father in divinity and co-consubstantial with us in humanity, because in him the union of two natures came about. Hence we confess Christ, one Son and one Lord. In accordance with the true meaning of this unconfused union, 
we confess the Holy Virgin Mary as a Theotokos, because God the Word was incarnated and became man through her. And through this conception, united with himself, the temple that came from her. Now getting back to the Nativity of Christ, we have the visitation of the shepherds and the animals in the cave. The shepherds were watching their flock in a very remote place that was consecrated by tradition as where the Messiah would first be revealed. Saint Cosma, the poet, writes that the shepherds were abiding in the fields received a vision of light that filled them with terror. For the glory of the Lord shone around them, and an angel cried aloud, Sing praise, for Christ is born. Then the angel joined by many others. Thus we see in the nativity icons angels performing twofold services. They glorify God and bring good tidings to men. St. Ephraim puts the following words into the mouths of the shepherds. The shepherds came near and worshipped him with their staffs. They saluted him with peace, prophesying the while, all the while, saying, Peace, O Prince of Shepherds, the rod of Moses. And this little excerpt is taken from Exodus chapter 4, verse 2. Praised your rod, O shepherd of all. And from the 6th century in which the first icon of the nativity was written, it is reputed to have been painted until the 12th century. From no icon of the nativity are there missing, are there missing two animals, the ox and the donkey from the cave. In one of the oldest icons, the ox and the donkey are pictured kneeling, believe it or not, as if giving thanks to God. Were these two animals actually in the cave on a historical night? Some say yes, others say no. However, it appears that the presence of the animals is merely symbolic based on the prophecy of Isaiah in chapters 1 and 3. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master, its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Both the prophecy and the allegory reveal a divine lament. To the shame of a rational man, the first to greet the divine appearance was an irrational nature. And if we study the history of the people, we will find the practice of circumcision not only among the Jews, but also the Colos Colossians, the Arabs, the Egyptians, the Abyssinians, the Aztecs, the Mohammedans as well. However, the differences in this practice from all the other people and that of the Jews is quite distinct. Because while the others circumcise themselves for reasons of health or for coming of age, or which is a certain age that they were circumcised, is always fixed. The Jews did it 
as a practice out of strict religious requirement shortly after life begins. Muhammad was circumcised because the custom was prevalent in Arabia and his followers kept up his example. There is no compulsory ordinance in the Quran. However, the patriarch Abraham was ordered by God to do, to do, to do it with terrible consequences on his ears if they fail to practice it. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among the children shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your home or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he and that is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall be circumcised. So thus my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. And any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people for he has broken my covenant. And this is from Genesis chapter 17, verse 10 through 14. And the great religious significance which circumcision was persuaded by the angel to be put to death because he was not uncircumcised until the child was circumcised and escaped all the dangers in Exodus, and from the habit of the Israelites to refer to all the nations outside of the covenant with the contemptuous title of uncircumcised. This is what we find in second in two Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter one, verse nineteen and twenty, upon the death of Saul and Jonathan. Your glory, O Israel, is slain upon your high place. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in God. Publish it not in the streets. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. The mystical meaning of circumcision by the Jews was that from a monk, from the moment that the child was born, he became a sealed property of God. And just as the natives of Africa or of Australia designed with a needle on their skins the tattoo of a particular tribe with a tattoo of a particular animal, their tribe, which is their emblem. Likewise, the Jew, from a primitive and underdeveloped time, underwent the distinguishing cut as a sign of the covenant between them and God. But it had nothing, but it had also another meaning as well. Since according to Jewish ideology, blood is a symbol of life and existence. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17 verse 11. There can be no circumcision without the shedding of blood. This means that the circumcised bleeds so that he can enter into the higher life of God. However, 
all these teachings were understood by very few and long before the divine incarnation and the ordinance of the circumcision had become an idle form and kept only through fear and having lost any higher meaning. In vain God would call, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. And this we read in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16. In vain did God proclaim through the prophets that not only the uncircumcised in the flesh, but the uncircumcised in the heart shall never enter my sanctuary. This ordinance, which served Judaism in its early age, was unable to keep Arabs applied, and thus it applied circumcision to the infant age as fitting for infants, but it replaced it also when he grew up with the much more nobler baptism. The author Ziga Venus observes that if Jesus Christ was not circumcised, none of the Jews would pay any attention to his teachings, but would reject him as a foreigner and not from the seed of Abraham. It was left to the Apostle Paul to show with a vivid phrase that circumcision derived all its value from keeping of the divine law, and if it did not, it had no meaning at all. And if uncircumcision keeps the law, it shall be considered as circus circumcision and shall come under its blessings. Circum circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man is uncircumcised, keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn them will condemn you who have the written code is true circumcision something external and physical he is a Jew who is inwardly and a real circumcision is a matter of heart spiritual and not literal his praise is not for men but is only meant for God and this St. Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 2, verse 25 through 29. To the naming of our Lord. One in, when at the age of 99, the first patriarch of the Jews was circumcised because it was only then he received the ordinance of circumcision. He also assumed the new name of Abraham because he was destined to become the father of the nation. Likewise, at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, doubting Mary, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived within her is that of the Holy Spirit. 
and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And this is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 20, 20, verse 20 and 21. The complete form of the name, which was later shortened to Joshua, and finally to Joshua, from which during the New Testament times, it was Hellenized to Jesus. In other words, Isu. Some of the fathers of the church, such as Clement of Alexandria and Cyril of Jerusalem and Epiphanius of Cyprus, sought the different to sought different connotations of the name in the verb. such as yesthet, which means to heal. But later, it was universally accepted that the name of the Hebrew origin of the divine name of Yahweh, or Shoi, Shua, to means to help, or to free, or to save. Thus, Yahweh, or the word meaning which means salvation or saves or will save was it more accepted and the name Jesus is found in several parts of the Old Testament and was particularly popular in the first century This will conclude um, this evening's lecture on the nativity of our Lord and we will pick up tomorrow. May our Lord bless you, keep you all safe. Amen.